professional in my presentation. I am going to present my views as a lay person, not as an educationist who belong to your category and the category of the eminent speakers who are present here. As a person who has dealt with the teenagers of 17 to 21 last 35 years, I always felt I'm trying to make them unlearn certain things and learn certain things in a short span of three years. I always used to think, why not these things be done in the first few years of their education? Because it's very difficult to make them unlearn. Mostly even learning is easier. Unlearn certain characteristics, certain skills, certain knowledge, certain things which are totally uh, 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 unnecessary for them, totally which is impairing their, impeding their success in their life. Their attitudes, their values, their personality, their self-esteem, everything. I mean, this was my frustration when I tried for 16 years back trying to, uh, you know, uh, <coughs> develop certain personal traits of them, develop certain attitudinal behavior in them. So I, I always used to think that yes, first six to uh, maybe about up to ten years is the right period for anybody to learn anything which is going to be last in their life. Somebody or probably See, long back it has been said that it has the whole uh, development of the brain or the whole development takes place in the first five years of a child's life. Of course, my heart was always in the early childhood uh, education, but accidentally I happened to uh, be a, a person with a higher education. But typically, not even the right to, uh, with, the, with, the, with the due regards to our constitution, even right to education, say 6 to 14, they are not emphasizing, emphasizing the, the first few years, between 3 to 6 years, which is crucial for a child's birthing. Even at a national policy has not recognized the importance of early childhood education. That is always my. Why early childhood education should be given importance? Of course, all of you know that uh, the full potential of the child, I mean, uh, Dr. Malti was quoting uh, Maria Mandiseri and uh, how the whole development takes place in the first six years of a child's life. Of course, all of us know the fact that uh, seed will not grow with the fullest extent, fullest potential if it is not taken care of the, at the initial stages of its growth. Whatever you do it, after that, the minimal development will be there. It may be a 10% development or 50% development with that. And uh, you know, children learn faster than any one of us. You know, all of you know with your children and grandchildren. I happened to, yesterday I happened to observe a child uh, which is two years old. Uh, she, was, she was talking in Canada. Suddenly, uh, the, she is a father is a Canadian and mother is a Telugu and the, the language of her apartment is English. She was talking in Canada. The moment she saw her father, uh, uh, she, she, the child started talking in Telugu. And uh, she started talking in English with with a playmate. Suddenly, her maid came. Uh, she started talking in Tamil with the maid. Imagine a two-year-old child can be a multilingual at the age of two. Whereas I find it difficult even when I go to Delhi, I you know to converse in Hindi, having studied Hindi also. So the fullest potential is definitely a you know. Uh, you know, because the, the child is not conscious of grammar, not conscious of anything. That's the uh, time. I was really amazed. I, I thought I should share this uh, example with you. And another child sharing the uh, couple of months, for one and a half uh, years old, how she was uh, playing with the cell phone and the iPad, and she doesn't know, she cannot read nothing the child can read. But the way she was able to navigate the iPad or the laptop is something amazing, which you and I, maybe people of my age group, will find it difficult to be in touch with the technology. 
One thing which I always thought that why the education should take place at such, such, such a young age is they are least corrupted by the world, of course, by the outside world. So now we have media to corrupt it. But still, they are least corrupted by the world. See, that is the best period for anybody to learn because the corruption is less. Uh, see, all of us will remember, I am only talking in the very, very uh, uh, fundamentally, all of us, you know, uh, I still remember my daughter learning slokas at the age of third, three and four. She remembers it now at 21. At, and the, 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 whatever I have learned it in the first six, seven years of my life, I am able to remember. For example, if every 10th uh, standard child or even an 11th standard child uses a calculator, whereas we are all due to the using the tables. See, even now we don't use a calculator for multiplication. Whereas what I studied in the graduation, maybe I would have forgotten. So these are the common examples where why childhood education, um, early childhood is very, very important. Uh, I always used to think when we find child labor, though it is prohibited, when child labor, when the child works in a factory, child works in a house, and so beautifully, sometimes she will be more competent than the, the, the woman of the house. With the odd drawing rounds. Then after a little while the teacher comes again, grabs the slate from him, drops it, writes R oh, again and says here is it. That's all the interaction was and that's all. Not one time did she call him by name, not one time did she ask him whether he was comfortable, why he's crying. No, but this is it. So that's what is happening the way we are trying to make our children go into the peer group. You know, it's a, it's a very, very frightening situation. And uh, they enter play by assuming a, available roles. When the child can enter into play, when I say play into the classroom also, then only he's ready. What is our goal? Let children observe before they enter the room. Let them sit still and watch others. If, he's, if you slow the child down, the model observation, and the child may try to enter strategies. He will do it. He will do it if you give him time. We don't. The very first day children are pushed into a classroom and the parent is not allowed nearby. They cry. It's a frightening situation. It's extremely frightening. And the first day we are putting something into the child that school is bad. So, you know, that's we have to think of. Conflict resolutions and social problem solving skills. This is something again we have got to teach children. For them to express what they want, think and feel. Regulate their emotions and identify in order to solve conflicts. Begin to attend and listen to peers. Again, I go to so many schools where this is not allowed. Children are always asked to sit quietly. Don't talk. Put your hands on your lips, don't move, don't shift. How is a child going to interact with his peers? How is he going to learn things from others? Then making decisions and choices and accepting consequences. These are indicators that we have to develop in children. And how do we do it as an adult? When adults let children to solve their problems for themselves, children learn how to solve problems. We don't give the chance to a child to solve problems. I know so many of you teachers, some of you I know very well. We do everything for the child, from even distributing a book or giving a chalk or doing this, everything. The child is not allowed to take do things or become independent or take any decisions in that. Helping skills. The indicators offer assistance identifies the emotions of others, regulates their own behavior in face of needs of others, offers comforts, begins to be generous. When the child does all these things, his helping skills are developing. And how do we do it? You read the child's facial expression, you see, and give him the support he needs. Whatever the support he needs, the, the adult has to give. Cooperating skills. What are the indicators? Exchange ideas and materials during play. When a child can do this, takes part in setting and following rules. Yes, that's important. Listening, uh, 
listens, thinks and responds appropriately to others speaking. Again, we have to develop these skills in children. And what, how do we do it as an adult? When adults admire how individuals make different contributions to the group uh, effort, children learn how to uh, how different strengths work together and are respected. The child starts learning when the adult does it. When the adult shows cooperative skills, the child learns. Empathy. Most children have this, but then when they learn to share experiences and communicate and express feelings with the adults and peers. When they start sharing their feelings, begin to identify with others, putting themselves into the other person's shoes. One child is unhappy. This child also is becomes unhappy. You will see it very commonly in small children. It is when the adult is treating, is treated with fairness and empathy that the child, uh, children develop empathy. That the, the adult also has to have a certain amount of empathy, then only the child is going to learn. Then interacting positively and respectfully shows respect for other children's belongings and work, plays with others who have different abilities and characteristics. This is where the Right to Education Act would come in. And begin to develop cooperation, fairness, and justice. When the child has these indicators, how do we do it as an adult? When adults admire how individuals make different co contributions to the group effort, children learn how to how different strengths work together and are <coughs> They start to learn. interacting with adults. They approach approach adults in a source of for source of security and support. The child should be able to come to the adult anytime. Engage adults in activities in a positive way. Seeks adults as resources in exploration and problem solving. How do we do this? Positive response to the children's approaches strengthens your relationship with them and reinforces their positive social skills. Taking another person's point of view. Describe their ideas and emotions. Recognize that other people have ideas and emotions. Engage in the exchange of ideas and points of view with others. How do we do this? Create discussions and experiences. Let children talk of their own experiences. Give, this gives practice to describing ideas and hearing the ideas of others who have the same experiences. A lot of discussion with children is very necessary. All these things, I think there were nine of them, nine indicators or social uh, indicators that are there, have to be there if we need to develop a sense of self-esteem or self-esteem, uh, which is a very, very important skill for small children, for all of us, for anyone. But if you develop it first, then the child will definitely grow into this. So how do we do this? What is self-esteem? I just put down some points here. It is an evaluation of oneself. It to feel good about oneself, have confidence in oneself, willing to do new things, to express the opinions, have social independence and creativity, like to participate, not to be self-conscious. So these are some of those things that uh, points out a sense of self. Now how do we develop this? Our interaction with children, with, with love and affection, irrespective of who the child may be. Respect children. Again, this is something we really need to think a lot about. Are we really respecting our children? We, we boss them too much. We don't really, uh, we never level with them. Provide developmentally appropriate activities. What the child can do. This, you know, I just would like to add a little short story. I uh, went to a school and in the upper kindergarten, new KG, they were teaching photosynthesis. You can just imagine photosynthesis to a four and a half, five year old child. So when I questioned the teacher, I said, how could you do this? She says, we will tell them, like how your mother cooks food for you, the, the, 
for the chlorophyll, the best food for the plants. See, so we have to think really appropriately. What can my child understand? And not just, if this has to be done. Before and after numbers has to be done in class one. So let's start it in LKG. The other day, one of the publications, they came home and gave me some books. Just imagine in the lower kindergarten, there are numbers, before numbers and after numbers. A child still doesn't know how to count. The child still doesn't know how to use numbers 1 to 10. So, you know, we've got to look at it appropriately. Encourage self-dependence. Uh, encourage children to persevere and complete tasks. If we do this at this stage, we don't need to keep children afterwards. They learn on their own. So how do we? One is of course role model. The teacher is very, very important. I'm also very passionate about teacher training and teacher education because I feel that we really need to make our teachers sensitive about their role, their interaction and their attitudes. And of course, encouragement. Te teaching children to share, taking turns, doing things independently on their own. We do everything for them. Then, of course, rewards and punishments. Praise for good behavior. And then there is service. I will show you what we can do. But then, for developing these social skills, we have to give this in our curriculum, in our school. The thing is, one is time. They need a lot of time to practice and define these skills. But we are always in a rush. There's a, also a common thing of completing portions, completing syllabus. From an LKG, UKG child, or even a standard one and two child, it's absurd. But this is what our, we push towards, you see. So how will the child have time to practice? Praise, appropriate praise and encouragement. Intervention by the teacher for success. Not to spoon feed the child, but just to interview. And of course, a very clear routine. We need to have a clear curriculum, a clear timetable, clear everything. We should be very, very sure of what we are doing and how it is going on. Of course, there will be, when we say social skills, there will be, we need to have discipline and sometimes, yes, punishment too. But what is it? Discipline is essential and will give rules and norms for children to behave according to the social norms. We have social norms which children need to follow. But punishment is given when, child, when children do not behave according to the social norms. Not, please don't confuse it with a naughty child or an active child. That is different. First, corporal and abusive punishment is not to be used. They are non-negotiable. We cannot have this at all. I'm not going into the details. I'm sure all of you know very well what it is. It's not going. I just said one or two more slides. My time shows I'm almost finished. Um, yes, thank you. Then how do we manage behavior? We will have children misbehaving and difficult children. Yes, all of us have children like that. Use do rather than don't. Uh, so the distinguished uh, forum, but uh, pleasure to be here. Uh, from a quiz, just to add to the context that he gave me, uh, gave to you about me, we've been now trying to get kids to play for the last 10 odd years. We tried to get kids to play by having a ground, we tried to get kids to play by going to modern complexes, we tried to get kids to play by hiring halls like these in uh, uh, Plays Russian complexes, we try to get sponsors for school sports, uh, tournaments. It's been 10 years, out of it, the last four have been where this whole concept of edu sports has taken shape. And some of you in the audience here have been kind enough to give me a, a gentle nudge in the right direction and even put up with all the stuff that we kind of came up with in the started. So, first of all, thank you. So, first of all, I wanted to thank you for calling me. Thank you for the whole school leader community for. Uh, being open to ideas of you know, partnering with people who are not educationists and not an educationist. I have no clue about how we learn schools. My mother was an educationist. She was a principal of a uh, principal school in Bombay, near a slum called Dharavi, which is 
towards about the system. And she used to come complain about the kind of kids she used to manage. And like any other son, I used to kind of dismiss out that day. Not complain. But after the last four years that I've met, I think at least 400 school leaders, and I've seen some of you work. I mean, I, mean, I think some of the stuff that all of you do is more than complex than some of the CEOs of a large company. So I think clearly society is not in a great job of appreciating the work that all of you do. So thank you again for, for the work. Uh, you know, a lot of stuff that has been said, so I've been kind of trying to, in real time, trying to rework what I should say, so to kind of make, make sense. Uh, this whole early childhood uh, education, I come from it from a very simple, kids should play worldview, as simple as that. I don't have theoretical constructs for why they should play, I don't have theoretical frameworks for different learnings and different aspects, but just kids should play because kids should play. But as I was seeing what was being spoken and what I've seen the last four odd years, my submission and what I'm going to submit to you is my learning over the last four years of interacting significantly with school leaders, with parents, with, with kids, and trying to incorporate sports and play into, into child's education experience, is maybe the, the problem of early childhood education is a complex problem, but maybe the solution is simpler. Sometimes we, some, 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 some complex problems have complex solutions, some complex problems can have simple solutions. And, and and I was listening to Madam speak just now, and I was sitting there thinking, hey, that I can solve with sports. Okay, that I can solve with sports. So let me tell you, I wrote, I wrote down some notes. So empathy, I can get with sports. Creativity, I can get with sports. Self-esteem, I can get with sports. Development, appropriate activity, I can get with sports. Discipline, I can get with sports. Kids learning rules, I can get with sports. So on a serious note, I think maybe the whole, the fact that kids play by themselves, the fact that kids want to play by themselves, and the fact that kids are designed to play, maybe as adults we are not giving it the value it deserves, the child education experience. Maybe we want to have solutions which are designed to us, and I will tell you, the child, how to learn. And maybe the kids have already have a system, which is called play, that works for them. And we maybe just need to encourage and facilitate that play experience in the educational construct, because we have a goal that we want our kids to learn a bunch of things, by the time they are of a certain age, and how do you kind of integrate that into the education experience is maybe one uh, thought that I want to leave with you. Uh, so I want to talk to you about three things. One is thank you, which I did, thank you. Second was why, and third was how. So one thing was that was about, you know, why should kids play fitness? So let me ask you a quick question. How many of you think kids should play? They should play more? Good. So then the why is done, right? Uh, but I think what, what I found was, Across the board, in the last four years I met so many school leaders, nobody has said they should not play. Nobody has said sports is not a part of education. Then the question that I've been asking myself is then why isn't it happening? Right? If everybody believes it should happen, everybody puts up two hands, then what is going on? Right? Where? Right? I mean, I, I'm telling you very often to wonder why do they call them play schools? When do the kids play? You know, I've been, I've been obviously as a, as a business, we've been pitching our product to, to companies and some of the responses I get is they come in at 8.30 for the for the preschool, they leave at 12.30 and we only have 15 minutes, so where do I do a curriculum? And I'm thinking it's called a play school, how come we only have 15 minutes in a day? What are the kids doing in the remaining two and a half hours? There's something wrong, maybe we shouldn't call it play school. Play school. So this whole play school definition has been a bit of a challenge for me as an external uh, person to the whole education uh, uh, system. But this whole concept of you know play because of physical fitness, play because of social fitness, some of the stuff that Dan talked about, also play because there is academic fitness. I and mean, there are enough studies, if you just Google it up, you will see, I don't want to go presenting that, about how physical activity has a direct correlation to academic performance. Some of the best people I knew in IIT were people who were fantastic in two or three sports. So I mean, there is some level, there is some level of correlation over I was on the Marsh Battle team and I had a tough time getting into the IIT Bombay Battle team. Right, so there is a correlation, it is possible to make those coexist and it is possible that there is a correlation between playing more and scoring better. Maybe we just not giving our kids enough chance. Maybe we think the downside, the downside of our, if my kid plays, what if the scores go down? And that downside is maybe what we and maybe all parents are worried about. That is the assumption that if you play, your scores are going down. So why in terms of that, why in terms of, you know, I think there is a holistic education requirement for parents and therefore how do we meet that and play sport is a clearly an issue. I think the other thing I want to point out is the off-school play experiences are going away. 
So as a child, today, if I'm a seven-year-old child, I don't have the opportunity to play outside my school, which I did when I grew up. So my dad didn't worry bother about what's happening in school because I was already playing in a mock school. schools. But today, a seven-year-old child, chances are, has a road outside his house. Has a, has a mad uncle who's saying, why are you playing outside my house? You know, has a car being parked and somebody screaming, you know, your ball hit my, ball, my car. So then the question is, as a seven-year-old boy or a five-year-old in this context, how, where do I fit? And that's where I think the onus, and that's what I was noting now, the educator's onus in the playing context is increasing because the off-school playgrounds are gone. The only time a, a child has play in their timetable is in the class school timetable. After that they have tuition or there's something else, but they don't have play. So I think there is an onus from a education perspective, how do you make that happen and how do you make that part of the experience. Other thing I've heard is, you know, my child is never going to be playing for the country, my child, I don't want him to pursue a career, so why he or first he has to play? So the question I have asked a lot of people is, let me ask you here, how many of you learn maths, maths at school? Have you learned maths at school? How many of you are mathematicians? Chances are none, I mean, I think you shouldn't be here if you're not mathematician. So then why is it that if, if a child is playing, he should be a, a, a career sports person? Where, why is that shift? Why are we connecting a playing experience of a 7 year old, 10 year old, 13 year old to suddenly becoming such a little girl? Right? We didn't become mathematicians. I learned math, I learned science. Right? So I think there is that need to break that connection that if my, and in a way, I'll come to the parent part as well. So how? So then the question that we went through and we realized in the last three, four years and some of the people here have been kind enough to guide us in that process was I understand what you're saying, I want kids to play, but I don't know how. And in my view, I think the how was broken and to me the, the easy way of doing it in hindsight was to map it to what education has done. And when I talk about education, I'm talking about core education, math, science. So math and science also have the same problem of too many kids not enough time, not enough space, too much of tuition, too much of curriculum to be covered. They have the same problem that I have as a sports person wanting to get this play, but you have solved it to a large extent. You solve it, in my view, with some tools. One is you have a curriculum. You say, in first standard, I will teach this. And if, if you, Mr. Six-year-old boy, if you don't know one plus one is two, you are not going into second standard. So you have a curriculum. You based on the standards, then you have an assessment that says, hey, if you don't clear this, you're not going ahead. You have to come back. Then you have a feedback loop where you call parents and say, hey, you know what? Your kid is a genius or your kid is really slow. You need to do something about this. So the feedback loop. So you have a curriculum, you have an assessment, you have parents getting called, you have trained teachers who presumably come with a clarity of what will I teach today. Right? If I'm a science teacher, I presume I don't go into the science class and say, okay, today I think I'll teach about the galaxy. But I have a kind of a bunch of things I should teach, and there is a pedagogy. And I essentially copied that. What we did in the last four years was copied what is working in the education system. We took curriculum, we made curriculum. So there is a need for a curriculum, the need for assessing each child on the health and fitness. What the difference we found was school leaders were struggling with how to measure my sports program. And what we submitted to school leaders was to say, use fitness as a parameter, don't use performance and winning tournaments as a parameter. As much as if I were to ask you how good is the math program, you presumably won't say that for oh, two of my kids went into ID. That's not the only measure. That is one measure. You would also say, hey, you know what, 75% of my kids are about 80%, only 2% failed, whatever. There's a very democratic measure of a math program because you have a very well-defined assessment rule. Do you know 2 plus 2 is 4? Yes, full marks. You don't know, zero marks. There is no in-between, right? there is no shade of grey. So with the fitness piece, we try to introduce that. So first of all, I am saying we copied pretty much what is working education. So for all the companies I am hearing about education, I am telling you the system works. For 94 cases. There are issues, but you know, people like us are copying what is working there and trying to make it happen in sports. And we said fitness. So if your kid and my kid can both run 100 meters in 10, 15 seconds, they both get an age. No, no different. Now, whether my kid is getting 15 seconds because he plays basketball, football, cricket, doesn't matter. Right? As much as if my kid clears your maths exam, whether he does it in school, after school, doesn't study at all, doesn't matter. Right? As long as he clears the exam, he's good enough. So, the curriculum, the assessment, 
the age appropriate and the activity and we designed it into a 35 minute period. To me, what I'm trying to submit here is the, the physical, the problem is a complex problem, but the solution can be simple. And one easy way we did this was to say, think like a child. Right? I saw some kids in the back. I'm sure those kids want to play again. Right? The hotel won't let them play because there are expensive chandeliers around. But kids are willing to play irrespective of the space constraint of time. And adults will think that if you don't have enough time and space, you should not be playing. So I think one, one thing we found in the to incorporate the physical element into this whole early childhood education was to break up the sports or the play field into fitness, skills and gameplay. And very often parents, and I'll come to, I think that's the biggest, you know, elephant in the room who's not there, everybody's complaining about parents. The parent thinks about sports as gameplay. So when, when you tell somebody sport, they think two acres of space, they think blood green ground, they think stadiums. But if you break it up, there's a fitness, there's skill and there's game. The skills required to play any sport, the foundation locomotive skill, manipulative skills, the basics of cricket, football, basketball, the fitness required to engage in a sporting activity, I can do it here. I don't need a playground. The only time I do need a playground is when I need to get some 10 kids to play. And if you go through anybody who's kind of played at a reasonable level, you'll find that 80% of the time you want to develop a skill in fitness. 20% of the time you are really playing a match. So it is possible if you take away the gameplay situation to actually include physical activity as a part of your early childhood education if you focus on skills and fitness. The moment you do that, space is not a constraint. You can do it in small classrooms, you can do it in corridors, and it's, it's possible to do. And because I think the other important piece is that kids are willing to do it. Kids actually want to do it. We think as adults that, oh, this is this can't be a good enough place for me to get kids to play. Or what will a parent say? And that's been another issue that parents will say, hey, I don't have a ground there, and so on. So I think that's one submission I want to make to you that what is working in your core education, if you just apply the same constructs to physical activity in sports, you will get 85-90% of the solution. And that, compared to in a lot of cases, zero is a big challenge. In a lot of cases, I've seen it as zero because the school leader believes that I don't have enough space or I don't have enough time, it is possible to do. Uh, the last piece that I want to uh, submit is the whole thing about parents. I think, you know, clearly there is this whole challenge around how, how do we believe parents react. There is an issue around parents wanting more grades, photosynthesis in kindergarten and so on and so forth. I think maybe it's coming from this point of view that parents believe that faster the kid learns more, the better it is for the child. And more and more we have found, we now have to with more than 20,000 parents in the last number of years, we found that one, there are two approaches to this. One is to say that parents are dumb. Parents don't know what they want. But hey, you know what, I still have to do what I need to do because the parents are dumb. The other is to say, maybe they are dumb, but maybe they are dumb because we have not educated them, and we are educators, educated them on how they should think about this solution. Right? And, and what we found when we went to parents and said, look, get concerned about a kid's health and fitness. Don't worry about becoming such a kid or a Dhoni or a Ashwin in the next context, right? Figure out how is your child getting healthier and fitter, because that is a lot more important issue that you want to face on the one. Second was the issue around success, right? The assumption that kids should learn in photosynthesis is because they think they'll be successful at some point if they learn this faster. So, and that's where we found that when we shared with them instances of people talking about how corporate success or adult success is a lot more a function of can you work with a team, can you this failure, can you set goals, can you work hard, some of the stuff that you mentioned in your, in your slides, and not academic degrees. Nobody asks for the academic degree after the first interview. And at the moment that comes in, you find that, fine, you continue your academic pursuit, but you also need this. So the whole question of pointing out that it is a, neither a, ne it's a necessary condition is maybe academic doing reasonably well because people use that as a screen to talk to you. Very good morning to all of you here. So it's been a very interesting session in the morning. Right from the time that Honorable Justice started speaking to us and to hear Dr. Nirmala and Dr. Prema and uh, our young friend Mr. Samuel Majundar talk about sports. 
So I was just looking to see how best learning can happen first at the formative years and then go on to see what the kids do to unlearn some of what they have learned and how the consolidation can happen over further reinforcements or relearning. So to define what schooling is about, is this the education, instruction, training that one receives at school or should we rephrase it saying that it's something that one gains from being in a school. So schooling should necessarily focus on not what the child receives but what the child gains. So and it is a popular belief that schools give education, schools, colleges, universities. And now we have another lobby that talks about homeschooling and unschooling. Necessarily there has been a lot of talk about what kind of experiences that the children get during the formative years. There was a reference to the child calling the parents daddy and mommy. And now my daughter, she is in class 10. She calls us Maddie and Dummy. <laughs> it, it started like that. But then she has been a huge educator, sort of a, the first teacher to me. I would say as I grew up as an adult and as a father and possibly started trying to be a responsible citizen, she shook me down at every level and said that this is what you guys need to learn. So my learning, maybe I forgot a lot of what I learned as a child, but then I revisited all this as a parent when my child started moving in to becoming a toddler. The best part of what I realized as a parent, I'm sharing this formative few years from the age of about one and a half to about three or four, are wonderful, lovely years. I would trade my job as the senior principal to be a teacher at a kindergarten school. I mean, that's from my heart. See, the conventional schooling now, we all understand, we are talking about classrooms. I was visiting one of the uh, classrooms in the kindergarten not uh, many days back. And there was uh, this program where Power English, one uh, program was being introduced. The dynamics of class, let's say that we are arranging all these and then the children were asked to move their hands and legs. But there was not enough space for them to even move their legs as they were seated. So, in short, we wanted to introduce something even before trying to understand whether there was a possibility of implementing it in the structured classroom that we had where everybody is seated in a particular way, people conform to a seating arrangement so they don't move much because the teacher decides this is what the children need to do. The children are not given the scope because the instruction comes from a public address system. Now you do this, now you do that, it's a sing-song way but then the kids so he is sitting in a small chair, he is trying to lift and then every time he is getting down on the, uh, the small uh, chalkies. I remember right through my schooling I never had a chair. I had a mat, I was sitting on the floor, so uh, squatting, no footwear. I was raised in Kalakshetra, so it was a wonderful place. But then now I tell this to my parents, they said, no, I mean, you cannot make my child sit on the floor. So it's not acceptable. So we try to uh, tell them, no, 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 this is what we want in a classroom. So they already have a mindset as to what the school needs to offer. And pretty much because they have not been educated by all of us educators, we do not spend enough time with the parents before the children get into the school. 
I guess we need to rethink on what we do with the parents before they want to put their children in the school. So we had a huge challenge last year. So we had uh, uh, a number of uh, parents seeking admissions into the pre-kindergarten school. So uh, a state minister, I'm sorry sir, he signs a recommendation letter and then says that and then please offer admission to a child in the pre-kindergarten classes. A two-year-old child has to be recommended by <laughs> minister holding a position to get into the, the school. Of course, so these recommendations do work. Now we need to find out. So, oh, oh my God, this uh, this minister is going to help the uh, the uh, the school getting new roads right away. I mean, let us let us give this child. So let's go for a start. See, we 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 gather a lot of uh, uh, students. We are very unsure about the competencies and the skill sets that the children carry. This was an interesting cartoon. I hope the the caricature is not here and uh, he is going to sue me because I am not getting <laughs> a copyright clearance from him. But uh, this is a pretty interesting um, cartoon that sort of places a lot of uh, diversity, does not understand the diversity and starts setting tasks. So when I do not understand what the diversity is around, do not understand the differentiation, how am I going to set any kind of exercises for the young learners? So this is precisely what Dr. Prema said. So the teachers from the side of what they need to do, they need to keep their inner eyes open to the situation. So the classroom is not going to get what you would be trying to convey to them on a day-to-day -day basis. So I, as a, a small monkey here, uh, I'm clearly having an advantage to climb up the tree, but the, the rest don't. So when I am setting a task, I really do not know what my child needs in the classroom. It's assumed. Dr. Nirmala said that we had a case where a child could pick up three languages, four languages at one instant. This is a remarkable kid. He might follow instructions in four languages. And now we, we have a polarized situation where, so uh, uh, Honorable Justice uh, Tanikajan uh, sir said, we need to accommodate the students who are hugely disadvantaged. They do not have any support at home. The education for this child starts and stops at school. There is no way the parent can offer any kind of support. The parent wants the child to go to a good school. He is willing to make all small changes in his working styles to accommodate the child in a school of his choice. So the, the schools, yes, we need to bend our backs. To good morning to all the honored guests. I was actually very surprised when Malti first sent me an SMS. Uh, I sent it back to her and said, I think you sent it to the wrong person. <laughs> what am I going to do in such an August gathering of educators? And then she said, no, 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 you have to come here. And I said, what should I speak? I don't know a thing about education. I only know what I'm doing. Big risk. So here I am. I hope I'm not. <laughs> So I'm only going to share with you some of my experiences as a filmmaker, because film is all I know, in my passion, and uh, some of my experiences as a mother, which is where my passion for children also happens. Uh, bringing up my son was one of the most uh, learning experiences, as Mr. Bahani Shankar said. And I think uh, I'll just put, I put a few videos together as a filmmaker, that's all I can share. So I hope you enjoy them. Right?
invite any volunteer to come up in on the stage and you know act like him like his demonstrate his style anybody
the answer he gives here is your brain, your mind, all these thoughts which are in your head which prevent you from being in the now and acting in the now. I'm going to show you another video where this little kid, we did a film on the irulas, the snake catchers and uh, I'm just going to show you this little clip. snakes, I mean you caught snakes and the snake ran away, it's a rat snake and before we could bat an eyelid, there was a little kid, four year old who caught it and came without a sense of fear at all. <laughs> how many of us would allow a child to do that for one thing but how many of us know that the sense of lack of fear <laughs> The lack of fear in the child, of children, of youngsters who are able to gather from their environment what they really look for, what inspires them, what catches their attention and they are able to freely move in and around that without these thoughts bogging them down. And uh, you can see that in this child, this is the Lingo kid, you may have seen him on UTV, uh, on uh, YouTube. This, uh, there was this movie Slumdog Millionaire where the youngster is a tourist guide at one point in Taj Mahal and he speaks uh, very good English. So there was a question going around how did such a street child get to speak English? And then this video came across, um, came up uh, through the emails and this child is an actual tourist guide. You should listen to him speak. Can you, can you show me? Which language? Uh, French. Oh, yes. Cela est une bonne chose, cela fait beaucoup de pique, joli. Cela est une bonne chose, cela a une bonne chose, joli, cela fait beaucoup de pique. Cela fait beaucoup de pique, cela est une bonne chose. Right? Okay, yeah, yeah. Pour faire Italien. Ça va. Ça va, le pavone, c'est un chien mètre de pavone, c'est un chien mètre de pavone. Moi, je vais vous dire que c'est un chien mètre de pavone, c'est un chien mètre de pavone, c'est un chien mètre de pavone, c'est un chien mètre de pavone. German, Paul Peter, wunderbar. Fung Sie so viel, schön, schön, wunderbar. Fung Sie so viel, nein, ihr Lohn. Aber, Albi, weil er tausend kann die Kubaner tragen, hat er kaum Sinn. Hat er zehn Wochen, hat er nicht mehr kaum Sinn. Aber, hier an ihn. Man war auch nicht, tausend Panjo Rupia. Aber, hier ist auch Panjo, hat er Panjo. Aber, Roschen. Paulin Maulin, Fischer Trubi, hat er Ruski Raspa von Nergis. The fish, fish at rupee, the three of the fish at, the commercial fish at rupee. After, Japanese, could you know, mini mini like a cat, call it one of the, call it one of the good opinion, call it one of the happy good opinion. Necessity and a context for learning. There were all these tourists who came there. There was a necessity to sell that little peacock feather fan. And he just picked it up. They are ingenious. We have to recognize that ingenuity in them and build up on it rather than curb it. Um, I found this, we may, um, as Pavitra mentioned, I made a film called Shakti Pirakkud, Shakti Rising. It's taken from Bharatiya Shakti Pirakkud. <coughs> the film is not yet released. But I had a wonderful experience working with some children in that film. Um, the, one of the children, we, we had a scene where a school had to where the students of the school had to make their project day presentation. And I told the kids, you know, uh, I want something on a tree. There was this one girl who was doing one of the main roles in it, Satyashri. And I told her, I am looking for a, a presentation about a tree and the good, whatever you have to say about the tree. So you come with it, you know, you tell me what you want to do, just come for, no problem, I am not going to tell you what to do. And she came up. For it, this is something she made. Since I told her it was about environment and nature, 
she came up with this little chart where everything, the tree bark, is all made from natural elements. She put this, she picked up grass and she picked up barks of trees and all these, this hay over there. It's all her idea and made of seeds. You will see the, late, uh, the whole picture later. And the entire dialogue, the description of what had to be said at that point was hers. I didn't give her a word to speak. So it was all her interpretation. I just had to sit there and watch and enjoy the whole thing. I just gave her the context of what it had, you know, what had to be done. What do you do? How do you, what do you do in school? How do you interact? What, you know, just chat it and use that chatting as a background. I've just got a few clips from it.
सीनियर टेक एंड चैंपियन एक्टर कट चल सीनियर शॉर्टस्टर टेक फॉर एक्टर सो द टेंपल अथॉरिटीज गिव स्पेशल दर्शन टू सम पीपल द ऑर्डिनरी पीपल गेट डिले दिस इज अंग्रेज गोबर
a, a few happy moments of my life. If I share with them, I feel they'll become a little more happy. You know? So I was too delighted when I heard that uh, I'm going to help somebody. Yes. Okay, suppose uh, you give something and your name is not known at all. What would you do? It's okay. Uh, my name is not known. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. All the videos which, we show, which you show, showed us a lot more than uh, what you could have spoken. Thank you. I know how it is going to be. I was just talking to Mahanti Dhammati when she often asked me to talk on emotional intelligence. I was asking her, do you want me to do on multiple intelligence? She said, no, emotional intelligence. Now I'm holding you all back from your lunch. The speaker before lunch is always, you know. Anyway, I'll try to make it as short as possible. Um, I did bring a presentation, but um, I think I will first catch on whatever inputs I got right from Dr. Prema and the other speakers. Because uh, rightly as Dr. Prema said and uh, um, uh, Dr. Bhavani Shankar said, schooling, we need to first prepare the parents before the child goes to school because she found um, somebody teaching photosynthesis in the low kindergarten. And Dr. Bhavani Shankar was rightly saying, we have to first talk to the parents to let them know what is what the child is going to be in for when they enter school. But I would like to share a small experience which just happened a couple of weeks back before I do my presentation. I thought I'd just share some of my experiences. Um, there is not a preschool. There is a toddler and mother school, even before the preschool. And I was a little curious to know what happens in these toddler and mother school. And the toddler is yet to speak a few concrete words. He is still babbling. And there is a specific curriculum for the toddler and mother school. The mother is very, very, the, as we find all these new parents, they're all full of enthusiasm. The mother has been to three sessions. So uh, I had a sit-in with uh, one of the mothers and I said, what did you do? <laughs> oh, until the first day, we learned all about clouds. I said, what? The child doesn't know an apple. What is an apple? cannot place an apple, they have been through a session and we did it through all the channels of learning. Auditory, visual, tactile, tactile, we touched cotton, we saw the clouds there, how abstract, we don't know, but they learned all about clouds in all the five channels of learning they have learned. The second session was all about kangaroos and the pouch in the kangaroo. This is happening just now. And the third was and so what did you do? Oh, he was looking out of the window as in the first session. The second session also he was looking out of the window. But I was prancing around like a kangaroo, trying to tell him this is how a kangaroo. Then the third session, she said, you know, my mouth is sore, auntie. I said, what happened? Because we were all buzzing bees and he wouldn't buzz, so I had to buzz. So I went shh all the time and now I have sores all over. That is initiation into education, even before the child can go to a place. And as Mr. Madhukar was saying, why play to become Tanulka? We talk about curriculum, we talk about children 
wanting to perform in classes, the parents want them to do well, my son has to study. So there are parents who come to me, put them in cricket coaching, and there is the mother sitting outside, watching the child play, going in for the matches, school matches, school versus school, 9A versus 8B, 10A versus uh, 10B matches, the mother will go. At the end of it, the mother will come back and say, why did you go three down? You were supposed to do the opening. This is an extracurricular activity. So the mother is there, the father is there. So the child has no play. There is no play. He has to be sensitive to what is happening in the extracurricular. Why are you playing this song? Why is it that you are not put in the front in the dance class? So there, this extracurricular loses its charm as well. So where does this child unwind even in a play? socially responsible. Are we imparting all, the, all of this to the children? It has become an ordeal when you travel on the roads, even if it is to, uh, to and fro from office. It has become an ordeal because the worst of it is displayed on the roads. No compassion for fellow beings. Uh, utterly and bitterly selfish. Being so irresponsible. Everything, everything in the ugliest form is displayed on the roads. Are we being role models? You know, it, it, it's time we start, uh, you know, it's time we wake up. And also I feel now I'm doing this show in one of the channels. Um, and uh, it is called Solva de la Munmai. And there is a lot of... There are a lot of ethical questions which arise uh, when it comes to this program. But still, I'm a part of it because I feel somewhere I can contribute. Ha having got the experience as a mother and, uh, you know, I, I feel uh, I, I can contribute somewhere. And uh, of late, we had some very, very, very shocking um, incidents. There was this little girl, 11-year-old kid who came to us. The mother, she's been deserted by her husband nine years back. She has four kids, three sons and a daughter. The daughter is 11 years old. She was raped by a... Uh, this, this lady, she's suffering from brain tumor. Just imagine. And she's got a small shop. She's a street vendor. And this guy who's having a tea shop opposite to her place, he has abused the kid. But there was some sort of a... Um, a somehow I, I was... I'm not technically qualified to know what, what the problem was. But there was some behavioral problem with the child. When I spoke to her, she said that she said, "Amma, te solla matting le. Ah, uncle na force pani kudi pola. Nana ida pona. Ema pona. And uncle seedi ala kami pare. Ena kada pakar tu kromo kudi kyo. So for the past three years, eight years lende, ida pani tu karna. That man has been taking her, showing her blue films, and then she is telling me." So, in the Mari in the in the segment in the total, you know, they are not, uh, you know, protected at all because the mothers or the parents don't have the time to take care of them, take care of these aspects. They are just bothered about, you know, basic education, if at all and their food and shelter, that's all. So, should we not encourage interaction between uh, uh, these kids, the less privileged and the more privileged? That will make them 
you know, that, that will create an awareness, that will give them an exposure. So I think that is very important. And also, <laughs> my mother used to tell me, you know, because sex education, they had a system which was working. They used to tell the girls, you have to take care of yourself in a manner which they understood. But now, this little kid, in the ponna, in the ponna, in the opposite la kade irukku, anga boy okkanda velaya aduva. And the guy has misused. If at all the mother had told her, nee vandu inno or tharoda, totte pesa kudadu ma, anga boy okkara kudadu, avan madi la boy okkara kudadu. Adhi da soli itur nanga. Oru pakkat la mama vandu, pengal a dairi ma irukku no, pengal veliya poi vela pannu, adhi la soli itur ko. But, veli la po na, andha lukku protection ha unghilik irukka. தமிழ்நாடுலி <laughs> At least now we have woken up. And other cup from Varisia. Varisia cake up the Varisia, you know, uh, that we know any incident. In the kino acid attack. So it is as if some all the men have become very violent, Mari Kapata. Why? I think people have started coming out with their problems. They are not scared. They said, okay, we might also get justice. அந்த மாதிரி ஒரு ஃபீலிங் தான் இப்ப எல்லாரும் வெளியே வந்து சொல்றாங்க சோ வாட் இஸ் தீடியா வாட் ரோல் டஸ் த மீடியா பிளே தட் வாஸ் மை கொஸ்டின் தட் இஸ் வேர் ஐ வாண்டட் டு டாக் டு யூ ஜஸ்ட் டூ மினிட்ஸ் ஐ ஃபீல் ரைட் ரைட் ஃப்ரம் த ஏஜ் ஆஃப் ஒன் ஐ சா அ லிட்டில் பாய் வாட்சிங் அ ப்ரோக்ராம் த கேர்ள் கேம் கேம் இன் இட் வாஸ் அ லைஃப் ஷோ த கேர்ள் கேம் இன் ஷி வாஸ் ஸ்கேர்ஸ்லி கிளாட் அப்சல்யூட்லி நத்திங் ஈவன் ஐ குட் அண்ட் சிட் தேர் அண்ட் வாட்ச் அண்ட் திஸ் கை வாஸ் இப்படி நாக்க தொங்க போட்டு உட்கார்ந்துருக்கான் கேமரா வாஸ் டவுன் அண்ட் ஷி வாஸ் தேர் ஆன் த டன்ஸ் ஹவு வில் யூ எக்ஸ்பெக்ட் திஸ் லிட்டில் பாய் டு ரெஸ்பெக்ட் விமன் வென் ஹி க்ரோஸ் அப் வாட் ஆர் வி ஃபீடிங் தெம் வித் ஸோ ரெஸ்பெக்ட் ஃபார் எமன் விமன் அண்ட் ரெஸ்பெக்ட் அண்ட் டிஸ்ரெஸ்பெக்ட் ஸ்டார்ட் ஃப்ரம் ஹோம் ஐ திங்க் ஆல் ஆஃப் அஸ் ஆஸ் டீச்சர்ஸ் அண்ட் ஆஸ் பேரண்ட்ஸ் i think we should all focus on it start right as uh, she uh, rightly said it should start from the age of 1 and i also plead uh, to my fellow uh, you know um, uh, artists and uh, technicians in the field that we have to be responsible because media has got the the power to uh, shape the perspective of people to a certain issue so we should be socially responsible we should we should take up this cause this is the need for the heart and also um, we were talking about less privileged uh, most of the kids that come to your schools as i see now maybe i'm ignorant i don't know they are all from well to do families i don't know even though there is a small percentage from the less privileged so i think these these are the kids who can make a difference each of each one of them should become a leader they should throw their crutches and lend a hand that is what um, we have to aim for thank you so much and thank you once again for giving me this opportunity